Thanks for joining us for CBN News Today. I'm Charlene Aaron. And I'm Ephraim Graham. The death toll is still rising from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. This is the worst outbreak of the disease the world has ever seen. And medical experts fear it could actually be much worse than the official death toll actually reflects. Ebola is real. The Ebola outbreak has killed nearly a thousand people in four West African countries. But a doctor working in the heart of the outbreak tells CBS News many cases are going unreported and the disease is spinning out of control because it's difficult to contain in a sprawling, congested city center. The bodies of Ebola victims litter the streets in some areas. But this outbreak of Ebola is remarkable. The cases in this you know, last couple weeks represents a third of all the Ebola cases ever reported. On record, there are now more than 1,700 active cases, including an elderly missionary priest who's been evacuated and returned home to Spain. And some infected people are refusing treatment in fear of being mistreated in a healthcare system that has one doctor for every 100,000 people. The Centers for Disease Control now has 24 staff members on the ground in West Africa. And at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit in Washington, President Obama called for even more health workers on the ground. This is not an airborne disease. This is one that can be controlled and contained very effectively if we use the right protocols. The Centers for Disease Control is now on its highest alert, a level one. And the World Health Organization is considering whether to declare an international public health emergency. Meanwhile, Dr. Kent Brantley and Nancy Wrightbowl, the two American Ebola patients, continue to receive treatment at a university hospital in Atlanta. The key here is excellent nursing, frequent vital signs, fixing problems. Nancy Wrightbowl's family has spent some time with her and they issued a statement saying mom is tired from travel but continues to fight the virus and strengthen her faith. The temporary ceasefire between Israel and Hamas is holding for now in Gaza, but Hamas is still threatening and Israel is vowing to respond if Hamas resumes fire when the truce expires Friday. That comes as talks are underway in Cairo. President Obama is calling on both sides to take political risks for the sake of peace. He also said he has no sympathy for Hamas, but great sympathy for the Palestinian Authority. And now there's proof Hamas has been using civilians as human shields against Israeli soldiers. Israeli forces in the Gaza Strip discovered a handbook from Hamas talking about how using people as shields could pay off. The Manual on Urban Warfare says human shields cause trouble for Israeli soldiers trying to reduce civilian casualties. And it says the shields give Israelis problems when they try to open fire on gunmen. The manual also says Hamas benefits from Israel's burning of civilian homes. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the world is in a testing period. At a press conference, he said the issue at stake is whether leaders will allow terrorists to operate within a civilian population with impunity, while at the same time blaming a democracy for defending itself. It stands before the international community with a wave of radical terrorists that are now seizing vast cities, civilian population, and doing exactly the tactic that Hamas is doing. That's exactly what ISIL is doing, what Hezbollah is doing, what Boko Haram is doing, what Hamas is doing is what Al-Qaeda is doing. And the test now is not merely the test for the international community's attitude towards Israel, an embattled democracy using legitimate means against these double war crimes of targeting civilians and hiding behind civilians. The test is for the civilized world itself, how it is able to defend itself. Netanyahu said if the world does not hold Hamas accountable, it will lead to many more civilian casualties across the globe. Russian President Vladimir Putin is, consider, is ordering his government to impose sanctions on the United States and other countries. Russia is releasing a list of agricultural products it is banning for a year, including all meat, fish, milk, fruits and vegetables. The sanctions apply to Australia, Canada, Norway and the European Union as well. Russia's prime minister says they're also considering banning Western airlines from flying in Russian airspace. The move is in response to economic sanctions placed on Russia by the U.S. because of the crisis in Ukraine. Is the Internal Revenue Service calling for an investigation of churches to appease an atheist group? 
That's the charge by some religious freedom advocates. A recent letter from the IRS to the Justice Department claims that 99 churches deserve a high priority examination for so-called illegal electioneering. In an article on National Review Online, Quinn Hillier writes that the IRS sent that letter after a lawsuit by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. That lawsuit called on the tax agency to enforce prohibitions against churches that engage in political activity. The foundation has since dropped its suit. And for more, CBN's Mark Martin spoke with Jordan Seculo, executive director of the American Center for Law and Justice. Did the IRS give in to pressure by the Freedom From Religion Foundation to avoid a lawsuit? In this case, uh, what we have to be concerned about is whether or not this is the, the Freedom From Religion Foundation making more of a victory uh, than is truth, or the IRS, and what's more dangerous, the IRS in a way now having some way to legitimize uh, this retargeting of churches and the uh, speech that's going on at those churches. And it's not just about endorsing candidates from the pulpit. This was about even talking about issues like traditional marriage like pro-life issues, and of course, uh, just recently, things like the HHS mandate. So we're not just talking about endorsing candidates from the pulpit, we're talking about critical issues to the community. Well, do you think the IRS is actually gonna go through with this and investigate these churches on those charges? The IRS was to use this to justify now implementing a policy of going after churches uh, because they discuss things like life and like marriage. That, that would put us into a new, a new realm, if you will, of IRS intimidation. And what you saw here uh, makes me nervous because of now what we've seen the IRS doing uh, to conservative groups, this targeting, uh, they will legitimize it and justify it any way they can. And I have to wonder if this uh, settlement here in this withdrawn lawsuit will be a way for the IRS to then legitimize going after churches that they wouldn't previously do. Well, let's talk big picture here. What will be the impact on freedom of religion and freedom of speech? Well, you know, anytime the IRS is involved, people get scared. But I do want to be clear right now. The IRS is on its heels now more than ever. Because of all the attention on the Tea Party targeting and the conservative targeting, the IRS has had a tough job. I mean, the division that would enforce this mark is the same division that Lois Lerner headed until she retired. So the division, the tax-exempt organizations, they also, Freedom for Religion Foundation, wanted churches to have to file what's called 990s. Uh, what 501c3s have to file each year. Churches are exempt from that. There was no decision there, so they didn't win on that issue. Uh, that's something to look forward to uh, in the future to see if they try to rechallenge the IRS on that. The big picture, though, is this. Will you be afraid of the IRS, or will you do what you've been doing without problem, and you know that there's groups like us around uh, to, uh, to uh, defend you if uh, the, the IRS or a group like Freedom From Religion Foundation is trying to shut down uh, your, your, your speech, which you have the absolute right to make. Clarify for us, Jordan, what the law actually says about churches and political activities. In, in the church's situation, the distinction is this. A pastor uh, going to the pulpit and endorsing a candidate could be putting the church at risk, and that was before this case. Yet that same pastor can, outside of the church, endorse a candidate as long as it's the church is, is clearly distinguished from the endorsement. So uh, it's not as if individuals, by becoming uh, uh, members uh, of the clergy or the pastoral staff, lose their uh, free speech rights and their First Amendment rights. So there are things the church has, churches have to be careful about, but as long as they're operating basically the same way they have been, uh, if the IRS, if this, uh, we'll know if this is some kind of new intimidation strategy if the IRS starts contacting more churches. Okay, well, we'll leave it there. Jordan Seculo, thanks so much for your insights. Thanks, Mark. The battle over Bible banners at football games in one Texas town could be heading to that state's Supreme Court. Cheerleaders from Coons High School are once again defending their choice to display Bible verses, arguing the school district is still violating their right of, to free speech. David Brody traveled to Coons, Texas, where he found overwhelming support for the hometown cheerleaders. Across the nation! The Kuntz High School cheerleaders may seem like typical teenage girls. In reality, they're anything but. Take a look at these banners the Kuntz football players run through just before their games. The cheerleaders began writing Bible verses on them last fall. I had a chance to meet up with the team and I asked them why they boldly decided to put their faith on display. We're just all Christians and we, um, 
believe that the Bible is from God, and so if it's from God, why, why not? <laughs> That's what we were thinking. Like, it's a positive message, and it's uplifting. The girls' zeal for God's Word was so contagious that it not only inspired their own football team, it caused the opposing teams to want to do the same thing. They also began writing scriptures on their banners. But a national atheist group, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, filed a complaint with the superintendent. They said Bible verses should not be displayed at football games because that basically meant the school was supporting a particular religion. The Texas Association of School Board Lawyers agreed. The cheerleaders said that was a violation of their free speech, and they filed a lawsuit. This case is really all about the rights of students to express their sincerely held religious beliefs at school. The United States Supreme Court said that students do not leave their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. The case went to court last October and a judge ruled the cheerleaders could continue to write scriptures on the banners for the rest of the football season. The school board brought the issue before the community to hear their opinions. The cheerleaders stood up for their faith once again and received overwhelming support from the local community. They're good kids, they, they've been raised right, they know what they believe and they weren't afraid to stand up and, and say what they believe and, and to take whatever came with it. Coons is a small town in East Texas, just a few thousand people or so. As a matter of fact, the town's claim to fame is that they are home to the only pair of married armadillos in the entire world. But now the cheerleaders have replaced those armadillos. Even the Texas governor and attorney general have publicly supported the cheerleaders. When you have the courage of your convictions, you can be a messenger for the entire world. These are girls who one day were cheerleaders and they were transformed into community leaders. Texas and this country are better and prouder because of them. What's going on in the school? What is everybody saying in the school? Are you guys like, you know, you guys are like the uh, the cool famous cheerleaders, aren't we're you? Still, we're no. still the same people we always were. I mean, this hasn't like this has just helped like our football boys and us come closer to each other. But I mean, everything is still the same at school. Like we're all still close and like nobody argues. Like we hardly talk about it anymore. <laughs> David Brody, CBN News in Coons, Texas. Two hurricanes are barreling down on Hawaii. It's the first time in 22 years that a hurricane has threatened the Big Island. Hurricane Izel is expected to bring heavy rains, winds gusting up to 85 miles per hour, and flooding in some areas. Workers on the island prepared for the worst by sandbagging and clearing drains. Residents are stocking up on everything from bottled water to gas and groceries. And tourists are streaming into the airports with airlines changing flights for free so vacationers can flee. The first storm to arrive will be Isel. Arrives here late Thursday night, local Hawaii time. Gusty winds, 50, 60 miles per hour, downing trees, uh, causing flooding across the region. Meanwhile, Hurricane Julio is expected to slowly strengthen and pass north of Hawaii sometime this weekend. President Obama is signing a bill into law aimed at revamping the Department of Veterans Affairs. The $16.3 billion measure includes $10 billion in emergency spending to pay for private care. That's for qualifying veterans who can't get timely appointments at VA hospitals or clinics or who live more than 40 miles from one. It also includes $5 billion for hiring more doctors, nurses, and other medical staff, and $1.3 billion to open 27 new VA clinics across the country. The new law makes it easier to fire senior VA executives for mismanagement. Scientists have discovered a link between a new identifi newly identified gene and breast cancer. It's called PALB2, and it's being called one of the two most dangerous in relation to the disease. Researchers studied 362 women. Those with the faulty gene had a 14 percent chance of breast, breast cancer by age 50 and up to at least 35 percent by age 70. The risk went up in those who had close relatives with breast cancer. Dr. Jeffrey Weitzel led the study and says, quote, this one is serious. Coming up, it is it time to change your passwords, the hacking scandal that's putting more than one billion people at risk. 
The Obama administration is looking for ways it can bypass Congress and prevent American businesses from reincorporating in other countries so they don't have to pay some U.S. taxes. But if the president acts on his own, he could open himself up to charges that he's rewriting the tax code and overstepping his authority. Both parties agree something should be done about the problem, but Republicans say the U.S. needs to cut its corporate tax rate, which is the highest in the industrialized world. The controversy comes as President Obama hit an all-time low approval rating in the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll at 40 percent, with a disapproval rating of 47 percent. Congress only has a 14 percent approval rating, and 71 percent say America's economic problems are due to the inability of elected officials here in Washington to get things done to improve the economy. You might want to think about changing your online passwords after a report that Russian computer hackers have stolen 1.2 billion computer usernames and passwords. The thefts affect more than 400,000 websites. The New York Times reported the story based on the findings of Hold Security, a firm that has uncovered online security issues in the past. The names of the websites that were broken into were not identified, but it is just the latest example of security issues when it comes to protecting people's online information. Well, your smartphone may pose a risk to your privacy. For many, smartphones are actually connected to the Internet making them difficult to secure and vulnerable to hackers. Smartphones contain a great deal of infra personal information, including contacts, conversations, photos, possible financial information, and more. The Wall Street Journal reports that experts will be discussing the issue of smartphone security at a conference as companies look for ways to protect consumers and their phones. Up next, a frightening look at terrorists recruiting fellow Muslims, not from the Middle East, but from Europe. When soldiers return home to America, they're welcome with open arms, but not in Europe. That's because these soldiers are Muslims who've been fighting for Islam in Syria and who may bring the fight for jihad home with them. Dale Hurd has the chilling story from Paris. This is a message to the brothers who stayed behind. These are British jihadists in Syria, trying to recruit more Muslim young men to come and join them. They've taken to social media to share an Islamic message with their friends back home. Even if you've led a sinful life, the Quran teaches that martyrdom is a ticket to heaven. Dear brothers, especially brothers and also sisters, when they land the jihad at the moment, with a Glock 19, yeah, most of you playboy guys ain't seen this yet. What we've come to do here is what's prescribed to us as Muslim men. But I also invite you all over to the land of jihad. Grizzly Instagram photos and videos sent out to friends back home include bags and even truckloads of severed heads. Someday these jihadists will go home. Some already have. Mehdi Namouche, the French gunman who killed four people at the Jewish Museum in Brussels in May, was arrested carrying a homemade flag of ISIS, the terrorists who have set up an Islamic state in Iraq. Mehdi Namouche went to fight in Syria in 2012. The French government knows it has a big problem on its hands. Hundreds of Muslim radicals who went to Syria to fight in the civil war and are bringing jihad back to Europe. More than 700 Frenchmen and as many as 3,000 Europeans are believed to have fought or are now fighting in Syria and Iraq. They are young men who did not, in their eyes, go bad. They believe they found religion. And when they're not killing people, they're handing out Qurans and helping establish a worldwide Islamic state. The mother of one of the jihadists talked to Britain's Sky News. Absolutely shocked to see how his character has changed. He's a, he's a lovely boy that any mother could ever have and want. He's honest, always caring for his family, always want to be there for them. And they, He's just one of those best boys any mother could ever want. This Dutch jihadist in Syria talking to a reporter via Skype thought it was amusing that the British government, by helping Islamic rebels in Syria, was helping jihad. It's funny. I mean, the British government itself is funding and training, be it in Jordan or wherever here in Syria, uh, the Free Syrian Army. So basically, the, the British government is helping, and I'm helping in my way. 
helping to bring an Islamic caliphate. So far, eight European nations have agreed to exchange information about the European jihadists in the hope of tracking them and possibly arresting them when they return. Strong enforcement is needed because there are many more Mehdi Namushas who want to attack in Europe. It's almost inevitable that having joined an organization like ISIS, for example, that uh, is even too extreme for Al-Qaeda, um, that these individuals will at some stage be sent back to Europe, to Britain, uh, and expected to conduct terrorist attacks here. French officials just uncovered a plot by Muslim radicals to blow up the Eiffel Tower and take down airliners. The former head of France's National Jewish Association says, unfortunately, it's a mathematical certainty that more European Jews will die at the hands of Muslim radicals. It is mathematical because uh, the cross the border is very simple. To buy a Kalashnikov, it's nothing. But the motivation is so strong. And the motivation is extremely strong. Europe's failed experiment in multiculturalism could suddenly become very dangerous for everyone when the war in the Middle East is over and Europe's jihadists all go home. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Paris. Finally today, whoever said praying, obviously, <laughs> paying, praying doesn't pay, obviously has not eaten at Mary's Gourmet Diner in North Carolina. No, HLN-TV reports the Winston-Salem Diner gives a 15% discount to those who say a blessing before they eat. Although the restaurant has been offering the special for years, a Christian radio station in Orlando posted the receipt with the discount and it gained some widespread attention. Patron Jordan Smith told HLN she and her colleagues prayed before their meal, and later the waitress came over and told them they were getting a 15% discount just for saying grace. I How beautiful. I think we should travel to North Carolina mm -hmm. to eat at um, this wonderful restaurant. That's right. We can stay and let the whole restaurant pray. Hey, that's right. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for now on CBN News Today. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We want to hear from you. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do it on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. Hope you join us again right here next time. It's Thursday. Make it a thankful one.